So I thought it was very interesting when we did the videos that most of the line of business users' minds are around data, right, about data analytics. And, you know, yeast and redesigning manufacturing, I think, is an opportunity. 3D printing is an opportunity. We had a display last night of 3D printing, new business models, and also robotics. I don't know if you remember Sawyer last night, but Jim Lawton's gonna come to the stage now, and we're gonna talk about robotics and the role of the robot in the 3D pivot and uh, what we can drive from that. So, Jim, come to the stage. I've known Jim for about 15 years. He's one of the most talented people I've ever met, so have a Thank seat you. here. And Jim has been a good partner for me. Uh, he is head of product marketing for Rethink Robotics, and I appreciate Sawyer coming last night. Yeah. yeah. He made a lot of new friends. So yeah. Thanks for, uh, and a lot of selfies. Yeah, a lot of selfies. And uh, tell us about Sawyer and why Sawyer is so significant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, for the longest time, if you think about robots in the US, you usually think of the automotive industry. 65% of all robots are sold into automotive. And the two things that they're doing most frequently are either welding something or painting something. They're unsafe, very expensive, they take hours to program. Guys like Sawyer and Baxter, his bigger brother, are a lot more like, a lot more like Rosie. Uh, from the Jetsons, remember Rosie? Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that you have this robot that you engage with in more personable kinds of ways, that you show them how to do things rather than program them, that are safe to be around, that are inexpensive. So we've got this whole new set of robots um, that generally these kinds of robots are called collaborative because they are robots that people can be around. And um, they can do things that couldn't be done before. I think that's really the, the biggest driver. There was a study done by um, BCG about a year ago that said uh, they looked at all of the tasks that are in all of our manufacturing operations, and they said 90% of them can't get done with robots as they existed. Um, and so we really looked at it and said, well, as an industry, we've really let down manufacturers if there's a bunch of jobs. I, I put it into three categories. I think about there's jobs that a regular robot that could do, um, and they do them really well, and they'll continue to do them. Then there's robots that people are and always will be really good at, um, things that require high levels of dexterity, high levels of cognition, high levels of judgment. Um, and then there's the third category, and we all know we've got them, because when I walk around your plants, it's the man or the woman that's not smiling. Right? It's the one that's just taking the plastic injection molded parts off the conveyor, counting them, maybe they're doing a cursory inspection and putting it into a box. Those are the kinds of, the only reason the person is doing that job is because the robot couldn't. So now that we have robots like these guys, we have uh, the ability to put them in positions that we never could do before. So we're gonna see a tremendous um, uh, increase in the number of robots that are in all of our factories over the next you know, decade or so. So when we had Baxter here last year, we mm -hmm. actually had a person from manufacturing that's like, oh, we need a cage around Baxter. And I'm like, that's old world thinking, yeah. right? Baxter and Sawyer are here to mm -hmm. really help us with the digital supply chain. And, you know, you started out in software, right? I did, yeah. yeah. And now you're working on robotics. Do you think it's a fad, or do you think it's here to stay, or how do you see it? Well, you know, it's an interesting question, because people ask me, that was kind of a, a right turn in your career. Like, what the heck did you, because I've done, you know, multi-echelon inventory optimization and supply risk using machine learning and that kind of stuff. What the heck's up with these robots? Um, you know, I don't think about the, uh, that I work for a robot company. I really think I work for a software company that happens to make robots. Because the most interesting aspect of what's going on in the space right now is what's going on from a software and a data and analytics point of view. I mean, if you take Baxter or you take Sawyer, you pull off this chest plate, I mean, what's on the inside is a computer. I mean, this is a computer with arms. I mean, if you think about a regular robot that we all deploy today, they look like, um, I mean, the analogy I would use is, uh, have you ever seen the movie Apollo 13, you know, when they try to get the guys back from space? They dump out a big bucket of parts on the table and they say, make something that can bring me home. I mean, that's what a regular robot implementation looks like. I mean, you've got a, a robotic arm, you've got vision sensors, you've got part presence sensors, you've got a PLC, you've got a bunch of people to wire all this stuff up together. And then the average robot takes about 300 hours to program. And most of that is a bunch of static if-then-else statements, you know, if this, then do that, if this, then do that, that's mostly there for error handling. Um, whereas, you know, these kind of robots, they don't, they don't require any of that. They, you don't program them in that way. They're very, they're very general purpose. Like when I buy a PC, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. I mean, I know generally, right? I'm gonna create some spreadsheets, I'm gonna create some PowerPoints, I'm gonna do that kind of stuff, but I don't know specifically. 
And one of the things that um, really has been missing in robots has been, I mean, we've left huge swaths of manufacturers out of the, uh, out of the ability to use robots. I mean, SMBs, small and middle-sized companies, they don't have the expertise to go program a, a bunch of if-then-nell statements for 300 hours. They don't have uh, roboticists, they don't have computer programmers. Uh, so you need robots that, where that isn't the case. You need more general purpose robots. You need robots that in the morning they're doing this job and in the afternoon they're doing a, diff a different job. And you can do that if you've got a, a PC with arms as opposed to you know, a more traditional robot. So they're flexible, they're safe, they don't need breaks, they smile, and they do really boring, repetitive tasks pretty well, huh? Yeah, yeah, they do. It's funny because you know, what caused me to smile was when you said they smile. I, at least once a week, I have somebody say to me, oh, we love your robot, he's so friendly and engaging, we love the way he smiles. Yeah, I mean, right? look at him. I mean, look at him, there's, there's mean, no mouth. he's adorable? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, we, we experimented with the mouth, you know what we got back for feedback? He's, he's smirking at me. <laughs> so, so, we, so we took the mouth off. We also had to be really careful with the face because if it looked too real, like if I put my face up there, that creates this kind of cognitive dissonance that like looks like a human, but it's not really. That got, that got freaky reviews too. If it looks too much like a toy, then you know, all of our CEOs come in and say, oh, what'd you invest all that money in a bunch of, you know, a bunch of toys for? So we kind of had to go right down the middle. But the, the face is there for a couple of really important reasons. And when we talk about collaborative robots, the collaboration part is you and the robot working together. If that doesn't look like something I want to be near, like we, we do on, on boxes when we take it to a customer and, and we watch them, and what we want to see is this. As opposed to, you know, kind of the, like I don't want to be anywhere near it because I'm, I'm worried that it's going to hit me. And so the face is part of that. The other part of it is it uses anticipatory artificial intelligence to indicate the actions that it's about to perform. So, you know, if I, had, if I had a soda up here and I wanted to go take a drink out of it, without thinking about it, my eyes are gonna glance at the soda, my hand's gonna reach for it, and then I'm gonna go take a drink. Without being aware of what I'm doing, I'm sending you a signal that says, Jim's arm is about to move in the direction of the soda, so that when my arm actually does move, you're not frightened by it. And so part of the head is, is being used and the face is being used to convey that level of, if you tell me what you're gonna do, because the robot knows where it's going, Right? I mean, it's got a path planning engine and it knows precisely where its arms are moving. Why not give that feedback to the person that's interacting with it? So, so it's those kind of things that, that really do make, and, and it's not just Baxter and Sawyer, there's probably four or five providers of generally these kinds of collaborative robots, but I mean, it's gonna be a $3 billion market by 2020, a $12 billion market by 2025. There's gonna be 150,000 of these robots. By 2030, if you don't have a collaborative robot in your manufacturing space, you're gonna be out of business. I mean, because of what they're gonna be able to do, really not so much from a, it's, this is not about labor substitution. I mean, this is much more about digital manufacturing from the point of view of, if you think of this robot with a, with a computer on the inside and all of the artificial intelligence and machine learning capability it has, for the first time you're very able, you're, you're able to very closely couple, I can, I can sense, I mean, it, I'm a data guy, I look at this, this is a big bucket of sensors. Now, Mickey would give me a hard time, but I mean, there's, there's just hundreds of sensors in the robot, right? I can sense, I can think, it's got the computer in it, and oh, by the way, it's blasting all of this data back and forth to the cloud. If it sees something, I mean, there's a camera, I don't know if you can see, there's a camera right in the middle of its head, there's another one that's on its arm. If it sees something that it's never seen before, it's sending that information up to the cloud, taking a picture of it and bringing it back down and saying, oh, that is a wrench, this is what you do with it. Um, it's also sharing that data. So if this robot is doing something over here and learns something, it's sending it up to the cloud and that information is going to a bunch of other robots that are able to then learn and gain insight for how to do what they're doing better, right? But then the, the, the thing that's really unique about robots for the, uh, and, and there are a couple of examples of this, but the, for the first time you've got the ability to, to bring together the automation of the cognitive side with the automation of the physical side. So you've got the, the, the sense, the think, and the act. Right? I mean, this thing has hands. Uh, some of these robots have feet, they move around. So you can actually instantiate the action that you gained for, as a result of the insight that you gained from the thinking um, and, the, and the sensing. So I think it's that, it's that close coupling that, I mean, you know, we, we've, we've talked for decades now about learning organizations. I mean, we're gonna have robots that, you know, that learn from each other, share those learnings, and then the experience that the factory's gonna have is gonna be profoundly different. I mean, we're gonna have factories that just think in fundamentally different ways. If you think about it, there's, um, you probably know him, Laura, so Peter Senge had written a book 
long time ago, about the fifth discipline. And one of the things he used to say was, you know, when, when, when um, data and insights are separated in time and space, we as humans are not very good at kind of stitching that together. But if you look at like the, the deep learning and a lot of the artificial intelligence capability that exists today, I mean, you know, they're big pattern matching rec uh, you know, recognition algorithms. I mean, they're really good at doing exactly that. Um, and so who wouldn't want to have a robot sitting there, you know, over their shoulder going, hey, hey, Jim, you know, you're about to do this, but trust me, you should do that instead. I mean, so it's, we're going to have organizations that have that kind of capability in it. And, and by 2030, that's absolutely going to be, going to be the case. So Jim, in prep for this conference, we tried hard to get someone that's using robots to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen. Tell it us didn't. why that didn't happen. Well, you know, the number one response I got back whenever I asked was, we get too much benefit out of this, we don't want to tell you about it. That was, that was the response, was we don't want our competitors knowing, we don't want our suppliers knowing, we don't want people to know how these things are being used on the line. Um, I mean, I got a video. You want to roll a video? Yeah, let's roll the video. Let me roll okay. a video, and you can see a couple of things that they're doing from a couple of people that were at least willing to let us put this in the video. So let's roll the video. We don't have at iRobot. We manufactured the Roomba in China, so I saw what was happening in China up close, and the era of plentiful, cheap Chinese labor was coming to an end. So it seemed to me that if we wanted to maintain our manufacturing of the goods that everyone uses it was going to have to ultimately be done with robotic assistance because there just weren't going to be the massive numbers of people willing to do those incredibly boring jobs. We have several other robots that are kind of the older technology that took a long time to program. Having a flexible robot that can do different tasks is going to be the key to our success. Traditional industrial robots are programmed through a script or coding language within a developing environment, requiring a roboticist or IT professional to spend hundreds of hours programming the machine. The necessary investment made automation an impossibility for hundreds of small to mid-sized manufacturers. These same companies were struggling to hire enough human workers to effectively compete in a global marketplace. Sawyer is really a tool for them, and he's helping assist our operators to do their jobs safer, you know, more ergonomically, and to increase efficiency. The future is here, you know. Whenever you tell people you work with robots, this is what they envision. This is what everyone's been waiting on. My son was in a few weekends ago, and uh, he had the robot running, doing something in about five minutes. I mean, that's the kind of... And of course, you know, makes dad a hero. I work for a robot company. Can I say one thing to try to scare you? Who do you think is the number one deployer of this kind of collaborative robot in the world by country? China. China has um, launched a major initiative. It's called Made in China 2025. It's part of a bigger program that's the goal is to make China the number one manufacturer globally, not just for cheaper parts or inexpensive parts, but for all parts, so including a lot of high quality parts, by the 100th anniversary of modern China, 2049. And what they've recognized is that over the last 30 years, what they've been really successful at has been a low cost labor region. And so we've all pushed a lot of our manufacturing over there if we have a high labor content um, in order to be able to compete on the global stage because the alternative was uh, to try to hire a bunch of people in the US um, you know, cheaply. And you know, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have um, my labor cost be high, not low. I mean, we didn't want to compete. Um, but what's fascinating about this period in time right now is they recognize, uh, and many companies recognize, that we're switching from what's going to drive competitiveness over the next 30 years is not going to be low-cost labor. It's going to be utilization of technology that allows your factories to learn in a very adaptable, flexible kind of way, and then gain uh, value in the supply chain as a result of that learning. So you would think countries like the United States, where we're really good at innovation, we're really good at technology, we'd be the ones out in front. China is subsidizing the deployment of every single robot in China. If you want to deploy a robot in China, they'll give you some money to do it. If you want to create a company to go build robots, they're going to give you money to do that too. So there's just this massive push going on in China right now. They're going to try and fail and try and fail and try and fail and try and fail and try and knock it out of the park and by then it's too late. So that's my one little bit of um, 
Well, and I thought that was an interesting factoid when we did our podcast, but let's kind of roll things back, right? Let's think about manufacturing and what happens to the people, right? So we talked about the autonomous supply chain mm -hmm. yesterday, and Jeremiah talked about cars, but robotics is really an autonomous manufacturing cell. So what happens to the people and what happens to manufacturing and how do you envision that in 2030? Mm -hmm. So a couple of quick um, uh, pieces of data. So we've, we've deployed thousands of these kinds of collaborative robots so far. We've never had a single customer lay anybody off, ever. Um, that may not stay that way. Um, but we have people in factories where, I, I mean, they, they really are struggling to try to find enough people to fill, to fill jobs. There's a factory that a uh, customer of ours in Texas that was growing from 1,200 to 1,800. They couldn't find enough people. So they really wanted to you know, supplement with, with robots. In fact, that same plant manager said to me, he's like, Jim, I, you know, we all talk about finding skilled labor. I just want labor, labor, like labor. Um, and so, you know, Deloitte has estimated there's going to be two million people that, uh, that are unfilled jobs. Um, you had mentioned earlier today the average age of a person in manufacturing is 58. Um, if either you're a millennial or you have millennial children, they don't want these jobs. I mean, they really don't. Um, all of our Chinese customers, I mean, the turnover there is staggering. I mean, it, it, 20, 25, 30 percent per month turnover inside their, of direct labor inside their factories. And so they're seeing how much churn there is and the cost associated with all of that churn. And so they're desperately looking for ways to, you know, to leverage technology. I think the other, the other piece, though, and we, and we heard some stats from Dar Jeremiah. There was another Oxford study from a couple of years ago that it basically looked at all of the roles that are in the United States. And what it concluded, um, which would be kind of a blending weighting of what Jeremiah talked about yesterday, 47% of all roles in the US are, in, are subject to some form of automation over the next decade. Now, that's both cognitive automation as well as physical automation. But we're going to see a bunch of roles disappear. And if you go into the appendix of that study, what they'll show you, in rank order, is which jobs are going away. So, you know, if you want to go find out, you can say, I'm one of those, so I've got a 0.93 chance of, that my job's going to disappear over the next 10 years. What, what, what frightens people, though, I think, is they can look at that list, and I can tell you, like, the jobs that are going to disappear. I mean, with a pretty good certainty. Uh, I mean, we don't have nearly as many bank tellers as we used to do. And we don't have nearly as many as, uh, you know, librarians as we used to. I mean, those are roles that, um, you know, have, just don't exist, you know, in those kinds of numbers anymore. But what I can't tell you and what that study can't tell you is what are the jobs that are going to get created as a result of having this kind of capability um, that, uh, I mean, no, no one would have envisioned, let's go, 25 years ago, that there's going to be a job called a social media manager, right? I mean, you know, that just didn't exist. Um, so there are jobs that are going to, as, as examples, so some of the things that we have people in, the, in the, uh, the factories doing are they've become supervisors of robots and people. So they're combination of roles where they're, you know, they're interacting with groups of robots. The, the other piece that, um, you know, as a, as a manufacturing guy by, by, by trade and kind of history is, I mean, I really subscribe to the view of continuous learning, continuous improvement, the ability to enable people who are more aware of the process than anybody else to say, hey, look, if I make this change, I might be able to make it better. Let me try it. Oh, it didn't work. Let me try it. Oh, it did work. Okay, so I'll go make the change. The worst thing that we've done to them over the last, um, uh, you know, 30 years has been to put a big piece of static automation in the way because the way that that got done was I hired a consultant to come in and set it up and the consultant left and we're not allowed to touch it. Well, if I can just go grab this robot's arm and change what it's doing because that's how you, um, th that's how you tell it what to do, then now all of a sudden instead of disabling um, uh, this continuous learning, you are enabling this continuous learning. And so part of what people are doing are changing, part of what the roles are that people are engaged in is changing the processes and making them better. So in some ways, we've, we've enabled, um, in fact, the folks at GE talk about it in the context of, um, I basically have an assistant. I have an assistant that's helping me make my processes better. Um, and I think that's really where the power is going to come from. It's not. 
you know, it, it's easy to do the math. Well, let me give you an example of the math. Just so this firm down in Texas, uh, the robot, it's this guy. Um, and what he's doing, what the, per, the, the people were doing was, um, so there's a bunch of testers around a person, they're putting printed circuit boards into ICT testers. So they put a board in and then they, and then they close it, push the button, then they put another board in, close it, push the button, and then this one's done. They had to put it in a good pile, a bad pile, a rework pile. That's what that person does. And in between, while they're, you know, they're waiting there, you know, they're waiting. Um, the way they've staffed that is, um, they have one person work for 10 hours uh, their first shift and then another 10 hours. And those two people work four days in a row. That's where their 40 hours comes from. So they're operating this equipment 20 of the 24 hours a day. And then at the end of those four days, they put in two more people that are operating for another four days, 10, 10, 10, 10. Um, so you've got this um, operation being run 20 of the 24 hours today of a day, four people running this one station that are $45,000 loaded apiece. Um, you know, this guy's 25K. So I mean, in terms of the math, I mean, obviously the math is there, but I still think, you know, it, it, the, the big idea is, 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 is what is the learning that we're gonna enable. It's the ability to leverage artificial intelligence in some fundamentally and profoundly different ways uh, that are going to, that's really what's going to drive the long term. And I loved your discussion yesterday, Laura, because you, you know, you pushed several times on, well, what's the ROI? What's the ROI? What's the ROI? If I'm selling a robot, I have, the, I give them the first discussion. 180 gets replaced by 25. Any questions? If I, but, but, but the more interesting discussion that I think where the value is ultimately going to come from is the second discussion. It's really about enabling digital manufacturing in, 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 a, in a very unique way. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the, that's what gets me excited about it. That's why I joined a robot company. Well, and you're such a great thinker. If you think about 3D printing and you think about robotics and you think about biomolecular re-engineering, mm -hmm. right? You know, what do you think the robot's role is in this? And where do you see manufacturing? Well, you know, you bring up 3D printing. We have a customer of ours that's using, um, that's using a 3D printer to create the hands. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we, we are really good, humans are, at our hands. But whenever I go into a factory and look for jobs that robots can do, the number one thing I look at is what is the person doing with their hands? If they're doing something really intricate, you know, that's just not gonna happen. I mean, robots are really kind of a long way away. But what they're, what they, what they're doing is, um, for a particular task, they're saying, look, you know, we need it to have a hand that looks like this, and then they 3D print the hand. Where that's going is you're gonna have the robot figure out that it needs to do the task, create the 3D hand, and, and I mean, there was something equivalent today in tool changes, but um, to use the 3D printer to essentially create the hand, and then the robot can start doing the task, and then figure out another task, create its own hand with a 3D printer, and then, and then go, about its, uh, you know, go about its task for the day. The other thing I think is really wonderful to think about is he is, he or she, I'm not sure mm -hmm. the sex, right? They're moving things, but they're actually that computer that's sending signals, right, which enables the upstream planning compliance or the mm -hmm. digital manufacturing and analytics, right? I think the capabilities are so much deeper if we allow ourselves to imagine. Your thoughts there about mm -hmm. digital manufacturing and the impact of the robot? Yeah, I think one of the things that I, that I should have mentioned about these guys is um, let me explain just how they get trained. And, and again, this is not Baxter Sawyer. All, all, almost all the robots kind of work this way. Um, but rather than program them, you show them what to do. And, and my analogy was when my son, um, the same one that was programming a few weekends ago, was learning how to tie his shoes, I kind of got around behind him and I grabbed his two little arms and I showed him how to do it. Effect effectively, that's what you do with a robot. You grab its arm, and when you grab it by the wrist, it goes into what we call zero-G mode. So the robot is using its motors to compensate for its own weight, so it feels, when you're moving the arm around, it feels as if you're moving it through free space. So you can say, move over here, click a button, grab this, put it over here, and then let it down. And once you've done that, it can do it over and over and over again without any intervention from you. You've never touched a line of code or a mouse or a keyboard, or anything like that. And oh, by the way, it's gonna do it more efficiently than you because what it's thinking about is not the steps. Like a traditional robot, you tell it steps. Go to coordinate zero comma zero comma zero. Okay, I'm there with the hand oriented like this. Now go to one comma two comma three with a theta orientation on the hand that looks like this. I mean, that's what the robot is internalizing. 
what the robot is internalizing in this case is, is the task. I mean, it's, um, I mean, it's built on behaviors. It's built on these goal-directed computational entities that are focused around an outcome. What are you trying to get me to do? You're trying to get me to put something into a box. That's what it's thinking about. So then it can start to apply some of this uh, intelligence in ways that say, you know, I'm packing the box, but mm, the data would suggest I can pack it in a better way or a different way. Um, and so it, because it's thinking at a, at a more abstract level as opposed to just move from this coordinate to this coordinate, um, it's able to start to leverage these technologies in, in that kind of a way. And that's where I think some of the, um, you know, the, the digital manufacturing, um, we're, we're gonna see, start, start to see that come together. I think the other piece that I think becomes interesting is, today the robot goes, you know, you have it doing its thing. Um, well, I can have it um, orchestrate uh, what's going on with the conveyor, because that's basically, if you abstract, it's just another set of behaviors. Um, so, so, the, so we have the robot orchestrating the behavior with the conveyor so that if the robot is learning that what's going on downstream is now resulting in maybe I shouldn't be building quite as many parts, then it can slow down itself and the operation of the conveyor so that everything is slowed down to accommodate what's going on downstream. So I mean, the analogy I would use was, I don't know when it was invented, you probably know, so just in time, whatever, 30 years, we can make up numbers, right? Oh, we're on film, so we should be, try to be accurate. 30 <laughs> years ago, just in time, right? So at, at Hewlett Packard, we saw, uh, I ran operations supply chain for Hewlett Packard for a number of years. At HP, we stopped measuring in just-in-time environments uh, on-time delivery, because I didn't really care about when the part showed up on the line. What I cared about was how much inventory did I have and did I not shut the line down? I mean, those are the things that were more important to me as opposed to on-time delivery. So as I start to think about, you know, what am I trying to accomplish, um, if I had said up front, you're gonna do these things every single time, um, there's gonna be some circumstances where it doesn't make sense. Well, if you've got a thinking, sensing robot that can detect anomalies downstream that then result in it wanting to change its behavior, if it's orchestrating the work cell that it's part of, it can change those to improve the operation of that work cell. Well, what's to stop it? Okay, so now I have it orchestrating the, the conveyor. What I have it, you know, providing orchestration of the tester, and then you know, and then the next tester, or it's orchestrating some other more traditional robots. I mean, eventually this gets to the point where um, it's orchestrating bigger and bigger parts of the factory. And just like, in some ways, just in time, eliminated a portion of the of the planning process, I think we are moving to, so these factories that are gonna be created in the future are a lot less planned and a lot more leveraging of real-time information and intelligence to operate the factory at what is, at that point in time, the best possible way. Um, an, a, an, another quick analogy I, I might make is, um, anybody here from New York, New York City? Okay, so we can make this part up together too. Okay, so you'll know, so keep me, keep me honest. So you get out of Penn Station, give me directions to get to the Empire State Building. So, I, so you can probably give me directions to get out of Penn Station and get to the, uh, the Empire State Building. But that's at the macro level. I mean, if you actually tried to follow those instructions, you would either, you know, trip over the dog, fall into a hole, get run over by a taxi, um, run into a person head on, right? Because uh, the reality is when you're walking that step, you're, you're, you know, you're dodging and weaving and you're slowing down and you're speeding up, you're, you're accommodating um, real time, you're, you're pulling in real time information about what's going on in your environment to optimize the way in which you get there. And in fact, if you weren't, you wouldn't actually get there because at some point you probably would be killed by one of those things. Um, so, so we're gonna move to an environment which is less about trying to plan all of that stuff up front and more about how do I leverage data and insight, not all of which is coming from inside the factory, by the way. Um, and we have experiments like that going on too, where we're pulling in a lot of unstructured data uh, from outside the factory and then using that to drive the behaviors of the robot so that they're able to do things in much more efficient ways, so the factories operate in much more efficient ways. So I think our, the concept of a traditional planning engine um, I mean, I wouldn't want to declare the death of the ERP, but there's something in the future that's going to look a lot different than, than what it looks like today. Well, let's get some questions from the audience. And as we run the mics, anybody that's got a question, raise your hand. What does the supervisor of a robot look like? What would be the job description that Andrew would write for General Mills for a robot supervisor? What does it look like? I think, I think there's a lot of similarities with the... Um, 
uh, process supervisors today, process engineers today, um, so people that understand kind of what's required to be able to have the line run efficiently. I mean, the domain knowledge of the factory floor is the most powerful piece of information, um, that, uh, the powerful skill and knowledge that somebody can have. Uh, that coupled with you know, a robot that works more like a person so that I can interact with it like a person, um, but good, good communication skills. I mean, I've, I'm now up to my, anybody have these uh, little Amazon Echoes at home? So it's these little digital assistants. It's kind of like Siri in a box with a speaker. But anyway, so you can talk to it and it does things for you. Um, uh, there's a, behind the scenes um, is an Amazon voice services that's allowing all of that to happen. There's nothing stopping us from putting Amazon voice services in the robot. So you can do something like that. So all of a sudden now the supervisor is interacting with the robot as if they were interacting with a person. You know, I need you to take those parts and put them in the box over there and the robot will you know, then go and do it. So, you know, so I kind of joke about, you know, communication skills, but really it is, what's the robot's ability, what's the person's ability to interact with the environment, having the domain and knowledge of what does it take to do, you know, successful manufacturing? Because we should be taking the robot out of the business. I, I mean, out of the equation from the point of view of, you should not need to know what ladder logic is. You should not need to know how to program a PLC. I mean, we have uh, so many of our customers that we work with one of the reasons they haven't deployed more robots is because they don't have anybody on staff that understands PLC speak. Yeah, I remember um, and, doing and they this ladder logic. Yeah, so, yeah, we shouldn't have to. But what does he look like in 2030? Does he still look this way? What does he look like in 2030? Um, I think there's a, so for robots to be safe, um, there, there, there's, there's physics that you have to deal with, right? So if I have a really long arm with a very heavy weight that's moving really quickly, I'm gonna hurt somebody. And regardless of how good the control system is, it's not gonna be able to stop that. So you've got kind of a portfolio of mm, trade-offs that you can have longer arms moving slower, longer arms with lighter payloads. Um, so I think, you see, I think you'll see um, uh, different kind of combinations. So you'll see, you know, Sawyer versions like that. I think with the advancement, I mean, one of the, benefits that we've had collectively in this industry has been to ride the tech curves of other industries. I mean, if I pull the cell phone out of my pocket, I mean, it's got a bunch of accelerometers, the same kind that are leveraged in the robot. Um, you know, if you think about the processors that are in cell phones, um, you know, it's the same kind that are in these robots. I mean, so the robots are able to get much more expensive. So I think we'll continue to see these kind of robots leveraging those kind of technology curves. But I think they're talking. I think they're listening. When I learned how to crochet, from my grandmother when I was eight. Can I, admit, can I admit that? I know how to crochet. Yeah, yeah. Great, so when I learned how to crochet, um, she didn't give me a set of instructions, right? She showed me. She said, look, do it like this. That's how you're gonna interact with a robot in the future. It's not there yet, but it's gonna get to the point where you say, Sawyer, I want you to do it like this, and, and it'll go do it. So, you know, you'll see, ro and, and, and so you'll see more sensors, more vision, um, uh, more and more kind of feeling capability. I mean, these arms like mine are built out of a spring. Uh, in fact, a whole set of springs. If I jam my arm into this, my arm flexes, and then my control system says, you're pushing on something that's not moving, stop. Um, and that's how these robots work too. So you'll see more and more advancements of those kind of technologies by 2030. What questions you got for Jim? Jim can talk forever about robots, and Pierre probably can too, so Pierre? Uh, not really, I just point to Jim. Uh, uh -huh. So, Jim, um, looking beyond manufacturing, looking beyond into the broader supply chain, into the broader value chain, into services, healthcare, um, augmentation of humans, and delivering lots of mm -hmm. different services, what are some of the opportunities that you see, um, you know, beyond just core manufacturing into broader service change and value chains, mm -hmm. you know, beyond, you know, beyond just the core within the four walls? Yeah, so sure. Yes, so I think there are some that are really close, like um, other aspects of uh, distribution and warehousing. I mean, if you think of uh, Amazon acquired Kiva, um, that's um, a, a, a way of organizing uh, warehouses that's, that's very efficient and they're using it uh, with a lot of success. Um, it automates a portion of the process, but it, then it still brings the tote to somebody that has to do the, the picking and putting into boxes, right? So mm, that should be done by a robot. Um, so, so you got those kinds of operations. Um, and oh, by the way, there's a whole bunch of people kind of chasing that space. So, um, but, uh, but you know, so you'll see those kinds of things. I think as the, as the hand technology gets better, you'll get to see more intricate forms of um, assembly operations that they're not quite there yet. 
Um, in fact, that BCG study that said, you know, today, you know, 10% can be done by robots, they project, I think it's 2025, it'll be 25%, so it's not going to 90. Um, but then I think as you get into um, uh, some of the service industries, like, uh, I mean, it's gonna be making your coffee, it's gonna be taking your orders, it's gonna be the ticket taker at the, uh, you know, at the, um, uh, the movie theater and things like that. So, so there'll be a lot more of those kinds of, you know, service roles uh, that it starts to take on, take on too. Um, healthcare, there's, there are firms today, we're not doing this, but there are firms today working on um, rehab robots. Like when I hurt my shoulder, the, the, the human who was really good and she was doing, you know, do this, right? And, and, and applying pressure will get to the point where, the ro where I'm interacting with a robot that's helping me. And those robots will eventually be not only in uh, rehab centers, but they'll also be in homes, which probably brings me to my final kind of version, which is this is a little further away. So generally speaking about these kinds of robots, they can, they, they can operate with more smarts like a traditional robot is dumb. It does what you says it to do and it can't respond to other data. So they're adding more and more logic and eventually we get to all the super duper AI stuff. But the other thing they're doing is they're operating the other dimension is with less and less structure. So today you build a work cell around the robot. I mean, that limits you right there. Um, you want the robot to work in the environment that you already have. In fact, some of our customers refer to, and I don't really like this term, but I'll use it anyway, chair ready. You pull the robot, you pull the chair out, you put the robot in and it can pick up right where the person left off. Um, but so you've got this kind of ability to operate in unstructured environments. I was talking to a big customer of ours and, 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 and what they said to us at one point was, oh, so I get it, so you built robots for unstructured environments. And that was a trick question because if you really built a robot for a truly unstructured environment, you'd end up with an ex a robot that was too expensive. We've built robots for kind of semi-structured or quasi-structured environments. But when you think about our homes, like that's a lot of unstructure, right? So, um, you know, get me coffee out of the microwave and don't run over the laundry when you do it, right? I mean, it's that kind of, I guarantee this bucket of laundry in the middle of my living room floor right now. I mean, it's that kind of thing. So I think, um, but we've got, a, we've got a ways to go there. I mean, I think that's gonna be a little bit longer. But I would go so far as to say there's certainly a point in time, I don't know when, and we can all debate over when. You know, VCs like to debate over when, right? If it's this, uh, I don't want to invest in you. If it's this, I do. Um, but let's just call it 50 years out. 50 years out, we're all going to have collaborative robots in our house. Uh, in fact, Rodney Brooks, the guy that created the little Roombas, would argue a lot of us already do, right? Vacuuming our carpet, mowing our lawns, those kind of things. And we love them for it. Thank and you very do. much, Jim. Yeah, thanks. Okay, let's give Jim a round.